Welcome to Major Keys. I'm here with Hall of Fame softball coach Sue Enquist, and I am so incredibly excited to be with you today. I saw you speak at a summit last week, actually, and I had heard of you through our mutual friend, JT Toms, um, but I had never gotten to see you speak. And so obviously in the nature of this, this pandemic, I was able to watch you virtually, and I thought I would absolutely run through a wall for this coach, you know? And so I was so excited to to uh, talk with you today. My first question that I always ask my guests, can you give me your sports journey in 60 seconds? So I know it's gonna be a challenge given your illustrious career, um, but if you can, from the very beginning where you found sport to where you are now in 60 seconds. I'm the daughter of a military father, a mother that was a nurse. They let me be and do what I wanted. Baseball came into my life through my brother discovered by uh, that uh, at UCLA, uh, Title IX recipient, was a player coach and uh, ended up loving the game the entire way. And now I'm a consultant in competitive greatness. Awesome. Boom. All right, a few things, because you definitely went under your 60 seconds, a few things <laughs> that you didn't quite mention that I think are worth mentioning. 27 year coach at UCLA, you had 11 national championships as a player and a coach. You have been inducted into six halls of fame, 887 wins with a winning percentage of 83%. And you are a daily surfer, which might be the most impressive thing of all. <laughs> so well, I thought all of those things were definitely worth mentioning that didn't make the cut. But, um, and obviously you're very, very humble, but those, those uh, you're, you're a born winner as, as some might call it. Uh, but what did, what did sports teach you? Um, you said you a little bit of baseball, then softball, but what did sports teach you? I think the first thing that has always been the foundation is what I loved about sport, because I'm 63, so I grew up at a time where girls weren't accepted or celebrated in playing sport, really. You were anomaly, you were tomboy. And what sport allowed me was once I got into that activity, it was as though the game didn't know. Game didn't care that you were a girl, played boys baseball in high school. That's how I got to UCLA. And from a very young age, what I loved and what I learned about sport is the people that were leading my sport experience really, really were driven by this vernacular around personal excellence in a group. And I had great leaders that were so ahead of their time. We had people that came from <clears throat> different sides of town, people of different color. And all while I was growing up, I, I thought it was okay not to see color. So the one thing that sport taught me was that everybody is equal. But as I got older and I got involved with UCLA, I learned a valuable lesson around, it's not about being equal, it, it's about being equitable. And I learned, and as I got deeper and deeper into my coaching career, I learned that we have to be more discerning about understanding that not everybody gets the same starting line. And because of that, who are going to be the caretakers and the advocates um, of those that, no matter what the color, uh, of those that didn't get on the starting line at the same time? And we live at a time where you know, systemically, we have so much injustice going on, so much racism going on that I, I really want our education communities to be able to lock arms in this common language around not only providing a safe place for student athletes to come in and perform to their best, but also to let their guard down and say, Let's all talk about our differences. So sport taught me that excellence doesn't negotiate. So whether you're the poor kid or the rich kid, whether you are a highly trained individual, if you're not doing everything on and off the field, excellence doesn't give back just to be the nice guy. And so I got a combination of both of that from my family. My father was a military guy and the standards were unwavering. And my mom was a nurse that taught me, you've never walked in their shoes. So I think for me, the, the combination of it is standards are unwavering around excellence, but 
building cohesion is about loving the people and their different path and their different journey and having curiosity and acceptance and and also advocacy. I think those are two of the really most important things sport has taught me. You know, you talk about Title IX and the importance of Title IX in your journey um, and starting in sport. Um, without having some of those role models that you could, you know, see on in media, um, who were those role models for you? Oh, it, it's it's kind of funny. He, well, this is going to be super random, but he he's still my bucket list. I had a poster that was like four feet by four feet in my bedroom. I mean, it was a massive po poster. J Joe Namath was my he was my hero. I was so into Joe Namath, the NFL Hall of Famer, um, and Willie Mays, who played center field for the San Francisco Giants. But the biggest turning point for me around breaking barriers was Billie Jean King. Because, see, I grew up watching that whole event unfold with Bobby Riggs and, you know, the match of the century that really gave all these women permission to put your elbows out and lean in on what you want to do and who you want to be. So my biggest influencer by far was Billie Jean King. At the beginning of your coaching career, you get the opportunity to do those same things for young women and develop them. And obviously you have a passion for that, for having coached for, for such, a, such a time over decades. Um, what did you hope that women in your program learned under your leadership? Well, when we first, when I first got to UCLA, we, you know, we wore the men's track team practice t-shirts. So I actually learned what it looked like to build the infrastructure of a championship program. And within three years, Sharon Backus built the framework that stands to this day around personal, professional, and team excellence. And I say professional because she always reference the standard around being a pro, be, be a pro in school, be a pro in your warm up, be a pro in your camp influence on young girls. And so the standard was really the game of excellence. That was, and she was just a messenger of it, but she was so amazing around, the hardest thing to do is to create belief when there's no evidence. Though inertia is the most, difficult thing to do. To create something from nothing is the most difficult. So I watched on the first row. I lived it firsthand. And she said, it's not about beating this team down the road. It's not about beating that team that's ranked. We were non-ranked. It's about a standard of excellence and professionalism that we must measure ourselves against every single day in everything that we do. And so there we were in the my senior year, we weren't even ranked. And we went in there, we beat the ranked teams at the regionals, go into the World Series, and go through the World Series undefeated and no one scored a run off of us. So imagine what a disciple I am of this idea around the standards of excellence, not a standard that you're trying to beat with the people in the other dugout. What does success mean to you? So what, what do you think success looks like? Well, I think it's really common that people, if they know you're a coach, they, they often will defer to the awards and the championships. And I, I, whenever I say championships, I always have to say, I'm gonna tell you why we got championships. We had a framework that everybody knew superseded every individual goal, whether it be a coach or a player, built by Sharon Beckers. Number two, we, di we did know what to look for when we were recruiting families where the student athlete resided. And you're gonna notice I said the families because we really evaluated how they interacted. And we let go of athletes. We didn't go after athletes when we didn't see those familial values that were active and enforced. And then for me to be able to have a program where my assistant coaches, if I was gone for four years, no one would skip a beat because I had the best assistant coaches in the country from both a technical level and an EQ level. They were just phenomenal in what they did and they were not yes people. And there were times where they had to grab my shoulders and like sit down and take a breath, get your foot off the pedal because they're dying. And 
I think the only thing I was really good at is I listened to my assistants. I think I was pretty good at that and it worked out really well, but I'm not really most proud of the championships. I'm most proud of the relationships that we built in this program, the bubble, it's called the bubble. And they remain strong to this day. And people say, well, give me an example. And I go, I'm most proud of the majority of my players now are having children. And to have them come down and spend the weekend with me um, is probably the most gratifying that they stay connected to the program and they want their children to have that experience of just being in the bubble. That's what I'm most proud of is the authenticity and the longevity of those relationships. That's great. And I absolutely agree that that is definitely success as a coach. We're going to shift gears just a second. So I'm going to do rapid fire. Um, yeah. I have uh, a few questions to ask you. So are you ready? I'm ready. Shoot. All right. So what is your favorite women's sports moment of all time? Too many, but I would say uh, it would be our program when we were non-ranked winning the championship was for me as an individual, the most crowning achievement, knowing that we were unranked. Phenomenal. Okay. Well, I was going to ask, what is your favorite championship? Is that, is that the, I, I try not to, I'm that coach. I'm that coach. I'm, ne I'm never going to be able to say, how, how yeah, can yeah. you say, you know, uh, gold, what, what, what gold bar is your favorite gold bar? I mean, when it comes to the results, uh, to me, they're all in one big giant uh, treasure chest. And I'm really fortunate to be a part of that. Absolutely. Or you could pick the Olympic gold medal that, and then that would just. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, that first Olympic gold medal was, was powerful too. <laughs> yeah. Who is your favorite female athlete of all time? Uh, Billie Jean King is my biggest influencer and my favorite person, influencer, advocate, um, and try and get inspired um, by her to this day. So Billie Jean King. My next question, um, what is your first sports memory? My first sports memory is my brother playing Little League. I was always the tag along. We're 11 months apart. He taught me everything I know about the game. And back in the day, girls couldn't play sport, youth, Little League. They didn't have Little League softball. They do now. And Coach John Springman, um, and I would sit in the stands and I would go chase the foul balls that would go in the parking lot. And he motioned me over and he said, you're going to be the official shagger. I thought I died and went to heaven. So I got inside the field and I was the shagger of all the balls in the outfield. And then after every single practice, he told the team that Susie got to hit BP because she earned the right to get her swings. Wow. So my first moment was with coach John Springman becoming the official shagger back in the day. Got to start somewhere. That's awesome. Okay. And my last question, if there was any women's sports event that you could go to, what would it be? Oh, probably, gosh, I've been so fortunate, right? Um, well, I'm just going to be super cheesy. Uh, I want to go to the Women's College World Series finals where UCLA is playing. I don't care the shirts in the other dugout. That's always going to be my favorite sports moment. <laughs> That's great. Okay. Well, I asked all of my guests the same question to conclude the interview. What is a major key or a piece of advice that you would give um, to women in sport? That the biggest fallacy is to reach the top, you have to be fearless. And that's not true. Uh, what you need to do is you need to feel it all and be great when you're in plan A, but even be better when you're in plan B. And don't feel badly if you're anxious or you have nerves. That's all part of the game. So teach your body that, and remember your body doesn't know if it's a roller coaster, a wedding, or the bottom of the seventh inning. Teach yourself that it's okay to feel and then just master failure recovery. Meaning when you fail, bounce back, be the first one back after failure. I'd say those two things. Don't worry about being anxious and just master your failure recovery. Because when it comes to assessing talent from a collegiate coach perspective, we're watching how you recover after failure. So don't worry about failing, go for it, but be a master of your failure recovery. Sue, thank you so much for joining me. As I told you, I saw you speak for the first time last week and I thought I've got to speak with this person. The fire you ignited, the inspiration that you were giving, again, I would if I were a player on your team, I would, you know, go the distance with you and go to the ends of the earth fighting with you. So that uh, is evident, you know, even speaking to you, that energy that you have, um, I can even feel it here. 
Um, so I appreciate your time today. Well, thank you for having me. Good luck and congrats on your career. Keep charging. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, and do all the things. And I'll see you here next time on Major Keys. keys, keys, keys. I got the keys.